Hello, everyone. For the next 30 minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Enigma, which is a consortium that's analyzing brain diseases across the world using imaging and genomics in a little over 100,000 people. So a quick summary of the talk is as follows. I'll tell you a little bit, maybe five minutes at the beginning, uh, on what Enigma is. I'll then give you an update on our international studies of brain diseases. And then I'll tell you a little bit about what's new in Enigma. We have some new working groups, some new methods, uh, toolboxes to analyze uh, international imaging and genetic data that you might want to try out. And then I'll give you a quick update on our brain genetic studies. And finally, talk about in the last five minutes, some challenges and opportunities uh, that we've been looking at uh, with machine learning methods, deep learning, and artificial intelligence uh, to answer important questions about brain uh, disease. So many of you are familiar with biobanks, uh, repositories of imaging and genetic data. And Enigma was founded in 2009, really to study um, a number of brain disorders using international imaging and genetic data. The overall goal of Enigma to, is to study factors that are helpful or harmful to the brain. And we do this by analyzing brain scans and genetic data from now a little over 100,000 people from 45 countries, uh, pulling data collected at uh, over 500 medical centers. And this is a joint effort by over 2,000 scientists uh, who participate in over 50 different working groups. And some of the working groups uh, are, are shown here. Um, we've managed to publish uh, collectively the largest neuroimaging studies of Parkinson's disease, epilepsy and ataxia, all, all in the field of neurology, uh, in psychiatry, bipolar disorder, major depression, uh, schizophrenia, PTSD, and substance use disorders. Uh, many of you uh, listening to this talk have led uh, these studies. And also uh, in the area of childhood and adolescent brain development, uh, the largest studies of OCD, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, and also neurogenetic syndromes such as 22Q11 deletion syndrome, and then finally some studies of infectious disease and, and its effects on the brain. So really there are two main goals in analyzing all of this data. The first one is to answer the question, how do 33 major disorders of the brain affect the brain uh, based on examining structural MRI, diffusion tensor imaging, uh, resting state functional MRI, and also EEG and MEG data uh, to look at uh, brain uh, synchrony and function. The second question is to understand how does our genetic variation affect the brain? So we screen millions of genetic markers in our DNA, either using genome-wide association studies or methylation and epigenetic changes, uh, which is known as epigenome-wide association. And then finally, common, uh, not just common, but also rare variants, copy number variants or CNVs, which often uh, cause drastic effects uh, on the brain's development, uh, but also they're relatively rare, so a consortium is helpful uh, to study these. So we do want to find genetic markers and other factors uh, in the environment, for example, that affect the brain, development and aging, disease risk, and treatment response. So two advantages of, of clubbing together to do this um, relate to big data. Uh, the first is uh, having a lot of data to analyze increases our statistical power uh, to tackle new kinds of questions that maybe we haven't been able to answer before, uh, cracking the brain's genetic code, for example. Also, the efficiency of analyzing data across the world using the um, aggregated computing power and expertise that allows us to try out new cooperative machine learning methods, deep learning methods, even some new mathematics across many countries. And then also there's the benefits of team science and learning from others, uh, a notion of collective intelligence, so to speak, with many perspectives being brought to bear on the same uh, data and findings. So here's a current map of, of uh, participants in Enigma. The colors are the diseases that each center primarily studies. Uh, now there are over 2,000 scientists involved, uh, the newest country, you know, 46 countries represented. The newest country of Cyprus, uh, Karolambos Karolambos, uh, is participating in the Enigma Stroke uh, Working Group. But uh, th there's broad diversity in, in terms of ethnic and genetic background and environmental effects that would allow us to understand factors that are influential uh, in the brain's development and disease. So here's a recent review, a nice review of all of Enigma, and then also one with uh, Carrie Bearden uh, in the journal Neuron, and uh, an editorial in Science talking about how uh, the consortium operates. Um, briefly, it's uh, organized into working groups. So there are 33 working groups that study uh, different brain disorders and diseases. As we've said, some of these are neurological, some of them are neurodevelopmental or psychiatric, and still others um, are, are infectious diseases. And some of these working groups um, are split into uh, subgroups. The brain injury working group, for example, is uh, studying brain injury that arises in the military uh, due to sports concussion uh, in, in children and adults, and also a very important new effort on uh, 
intimate partner violence. And as you can imagine, the causes and consequences of these different uh, conditions vary to some degree depending on the type of injury. So that's why the group has been organized in that way. Also, technical groups uh, support the analysis of international data, um, MRI, diffusion imaging, and resting state we've mentioned. There are also dedicated groups that analyze specific brain features, uh, hippocampal subfields, for example. Uh, and also in the genome, there are specific groups that analyze common and rare variants, uh, epigenetic variation, as we've mentioned, uh, and also study uh, various features of, of uh, typical development uh, throughout life, including sex differences uh, and even differences in, in, in uh, transgender uh, individuals. So here's a layout of all the groups, neurology, psychiatry, development uh, we, we've covered. Um, and here are the, some of the folks that lead uh, the efforts. Many of you will recognize some of the people uh, represented here. So as the consortium grows, um, you can imagine that a working group studying one disease, the little dots here are scientists uh, working with each other and the lines are the collaborations and communications within, between them. Th this can grow to um, groups studying other diseases with the same methods. And one of the ways to consider this uh, collaborative topology is as a modular hierarchical network where perhaps people that are studying a particular disease might use MRI, DTI, or functional MRI. There might then be analogous studies of another disease using the same methods. And then there are bridges between the groups to look at cross-disorder effects, uh, comparisons of one disorder with another, and even comparisons of different uh, modalities of imaging uh, that give different perspectives on a disorder. So this has led to, in fact, the largest neuroimaging dis uh, studies of, of nine different disorders shown here. These are maps of the gray matter, cortical gray matter thinning uh, in each of the disorders represented here. You can see that they're all very different. Uh, and you can even buy, uh, or we'll send you it, a, a t-shirt that represents these different uh, types of data. Now, just recently, uh, in fact, next month, um, there's going to be a special issue of the journal Human Brain Mapping that highlights many of the findings of the Enigma working groups. There's reviews by clinical working groups. There's surveys of methods for data integration across sites that are, are shown here. And there's also a, a survey of what has been discovered uh, on the genetic side, looking at common and rare genetic variation and how they contribute to uh, brain disease. And then also there's a number of new empirical studies of brain disorders, changes throughout life. Uh, you can see many of these are the largest studies to date of the disorders and conditions that they study. So many of these papers are online now and it'll be assembled into a, a special issue of the journal uh, next month in October. So just for five minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about our international studies of brain disease and give you some updates. So Enigma began by studying a number of different disorders from the point of view of brain structure. Um, parts of the brain were measured automatically using uh, standardized protocols. And the first question was to see how each of the individual disorders um, affected uh, the structural morphometry of the brain. Here you see uh, deficits, primarily deficits, um, in cortical gray matter thickness when you compare uh, individuals with a disorder versus controls. And then obviously, as you move on and look at different disorders, um, the pattern and distribution of the effects can be compared with each other. And as you begin to see the same methods being applied to numerous disorders, some are very restricted in their effects. Others uh, such as schizophrenia and epilepsy have very pervasive effects in the brain. And others tend to have um, actually hypertrophy. So that they're not always deficits in brain structure. There's some disorders such as autism, autism spectrum disorder, where there are, um, there's more brain tissue in certain parts of the brain. So in the past year, these have been expanded to uh, include the largest international studies of Parkinson's disease uh, using neuroimaging, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, a new study of anorexia and eating disorders is just being completed. And also um, very large scale studies to understand the effects on the brain of being at clinical high risk for psychosis, uh, schizotypy, uh, as, as I mentioned before, rare genetic disorders where it's uh, unusual to assemble uh, enough data to get an average or aggregate picture of the effect of the disease. And I mentioned that some of these disorders are quite different. So for example, in major depression, the limbic system shows structural deficits, whereas in bipolar disorder where manic symptoms are also present, uh, the frontal cortex also show, shows structural abnormalities uh, distinguishing the two disorders. And you can make a sort of dictionary or, or plot um, of the differences that are seen in different parts of the brain across disorders such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, uh, and for that matter, ADHD, and begin to see characteristic signatures that are typical uh, of each of these. 
Now, is this universal? Is it, is it just found by a small group of scientists or is it likely to replicate elsewhere? There's a very concerted effort by the uh, Kokoro Consortium in Japan uh, that's led by Ryota Hashimoto. And they've been using similar analytic protocols um, essentially to analyze the same psychiatric conditions in their consortium Kokoro across Japan. You could see the sites where data was collected and finding extremely highly uh, congruent results with even the rank order of brain structures that are affected appearing to be almost exactly the same between primarily European uh, descent cohorts and, and the Japanese cohorts. And they, they've written a very nice review uh, recently out um, to compare the, the um, findings across uh, Japan with the ones that have been found in Enigma. Beyond meta-analysis, we're well aware that some of these disorders are progressive. It doesn't make sense to say that this is the picture of disease. Recently completed study by Enigma Parkinson surveyed data from 20 countries, and they stratified the patients into uh, individuals with different stages of Parkinson's disease. There's a, a honan yar staging system, which uh, uh, describes for progressive um, abnormalities in, in clinical function. And as you can see here, and, and perhaps a little bit more clearly on the next slide, there's not just an overall pattern of gray matter um, thinning in Parkinson's disease, but also as the disease progresses, a sequence or, or, or a progressive uh, trajectory of the disorder in the brain, primarily affecting gray matter thickness, but also with subtle abnormalities in the surface area of the brain. Other new working groups in Enigma, uh, this study of clinical high risk of psychosis was led by uh, Maria Jalbozikowski and Dennis Hernaus. Um, they, they assembled a truly vast sample uh, from 31 cohorts um, to, to really find that people at clinical high risk for psychosis have gray matter reductions in certain parts of the brain, the temporal cortex in particular. And even within the people at high risk, those who went on to develop psychosis versus those who did not uh, had even greater abnormalities. You can see the, uh, the, the fusiform gyrus, uh, the paracentral gyrus, and the superior temporal cortex are among the areas that help predict whether an individual will go on to develop psychosis. Very subtle conditions such as schizotypy are also being studied. So this very nice uh, study uh, by Gemma Modinos, Andre Aleman, and Matthias Kirchner um, looked at schizotypy. It's a, a, an unusual and uh, disorganized pattern of thinking, uh, which is not always regarded as a disorder, um, together with interpersonal dis uh, uh, difficulties in, in, in socializing and also magical uh, ideation in some cases. And because this may raise the vulnerability, at least in some people, not everyone with this uh, condition uh, for, for disorders such as schizophrenia, there's a lot of interest in what brain differences there might be. And they found very subtle differences in the frontal cortex uh, between people with high schizotypy scores uh, and those who did not. All these results of the different disorders are compiled in the Enigma viewer uh, that's been written by Katie Kat Hatch and Peter Kochanov at University of Maryland. Um, and also the Enigma toolbox has recently been developed, recently published in Nature Methods by Sarah Larivière and Boris Bernhardt and their team at McGill University in Montreal. Um, I do recommend you have a look at this. It's really interesting. It can relate brain maps to other sources of brain data on gene expression, cytoarchitecture, myeloarchitecture, and even multimodal connectomics. And they provide re really magnificent uh, tools, uh, both in Python and MATLAB, uh, to help you analyze not just your brain imaging data, but also relate it to uh, other sources of histologic uh, and cellular data. Now, one of the most interesting studies across all of the disorders that Enigma has been uh, studying was led by Yash Patel and Thomas Pau. So they were interested in uh, uh, um, relating the brain abnormalities that are seen in psychiatric conditions to possible cellular and molecular changes, including uh, gene expression changes. We don't always know what uh, types of brain cells are implicated in psychiatric illness. So they lined up the maps of deficits across the many disorders with patterns of gene expression, and in particular types of gene expression that are characteristic of certain cell types in the cortex. And there's a very interesting story here of um, you know, disorders that seem to influence um, the cortical surface area um, they tend to um, overlap in terms of their abnormalities with genes expressed prenatally, uh, but, gene, but um, genes expressed postnatally tend to have an expression pattern that overlaps uh, with gray matter deficits, cortical thickness deficits uh, in some of the disorders. So very, very interesting line of work. Moving beyond brain structure, there are many analyses in Enigma uh, going into um, resting state functional MRI, EEG, MEG, other functional data modalities. I'll give you a little bit of a summary of those uh, in the next few slides.
Um, the methods and toolboxes that have been developed for these are as follows. So Ellison Nugent, Alan Amist, and Jeff Stout, who lead Enigma MEG, um, they, they have developed a pipeline for processing MEG uh, from uh, patients and controls to plot uh, parameters of the spectrum, uh, a functional uh, synchrony or electrical activity measured using uh, EEG on, on the cortex. And, and they're in the midst of studying changes throughout life uh, with aging and in a variety of psychiatric disorders. Um, also, Henrik Walter, uh, Leo Waller, um, Suzanne Erk, and Ilya Ver have developed a task-based functional MRI working group uh, where people with functional imaging data on emotional face processing, reward processing, and working memory uh, can participate and link that to genetic genome-wide information. They now have over 10,000 people with both genomic and, and functional data. And they also are processing this data um, with a really terrific pipeline based on uh, the Stanford fMRI PrEP framework, but also uh, expanded with numerous additional features. So you can meta-analyze your resting state functional MRI data as well. And I encourage you to have a look at uh, this. There's a very nice preprint describing it uh, with Leah Waller, and she's given a number of tutorials on using this to analyze and meta-analyze your resting state and task-based fMRI. This has been applied to multi-site data in Enigma's PTSD working group, a partnership with the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. And uh, Carissa Weiss has uh, finished analysis of over 20 sites where she's been looking at both static and dynamic changes uh, in brain connectivity, functional connectivity, uh, as assessed using resting state fMRI, uh, finding characteristic differences in PTSD. Moving on to diffusion tensor imaging, there are now over 10 of the largest studies conducted uh, of the disorders shown here, along with work underway on HIV, uh, brain injury, Parkinson's, and, and the other disorders with the people listed here leading them. And in the end, um, there's a great deal of interest in mapping the microstructural differences. Um, there's a little bit more heterogeneity in the imaging protocols. And so, as you'll see here, um, some of the methods that have been used to mitigate uh, the differences across scanners uh, are also being tested across Enigma. Here's a paper by Sean Hatton and the Epilepsy Working Group that has been looking at methods to align and compensate for uh, scanner effects in their diffusion MRI data. One of the approaches that's most common is combat. Uh, after fitting a statistical model, you look at the residuals and you scale and shift them so that the data from different centers match, it matches. And this is one very interesting and useful approach. Another approach is using deep learning and generative adversarial networks. Here, our student Dan Moyer developed a method um, to essentially say, how would your brain look if you'd been scanned on a different scanner? Very, very ingenious approach. Um, it allows you to take MRI data, um, adjust it so that it looks like it had been collected at a different site. And the hope then is that if you do this, uh, the ability to detect the effects of disease and not circumstantial factors such as the, the scanner protocol uh, is greatly improved. And there is some evidence that this works. This is work by Sarabi Sinha, Sinha in our, our lab, where she's used generative adversarial networks to correct or adjust MRI data at source, and then found that it's easier uh, to detect Alzheimer's disease in the resulting aggregate of scans after this correction. The VBM toolbox of Enigma, developed by Matthew Kempton, uh, produces whole brain maps of structural differences in, in, in disease. Uh, this is a really beautiful uh, uh, animation of um, essentially the effect of OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder on the brain as observed when you add uh, more and more cohorts. And so you know, going up to uh, 20, 24, 25 uh, cohorts, you'll see uh, the regions with gray matter abnormalities in OCD uh, settling down as more and more data is added in. There's also a pipeline uh, developed for analyzing the cerebellum in Enigma, developed by Ian Harding and Rebecca Kirestes uh, at Monash University. This was used in a recently published study, in, in fact, published last year, last week in Annals of Neurology, where they um, looked at 10 different sites around the world uh, who'd been examining Friedrich's ataxia uh, using MRI. And you'll see these beautiful maps of the cerebellum that they uh, produced using their voxel-based analytic pipeline, showing a progression uh, of structural abnormalities that depend both on the duration of illness and the time of onset. So you can see a great deal of information is being learned here about the trajectory of these uh, uh, ataxias. Moving on briefly to genetics, uh, many of you contributed to this uh, remarkable paper in science uh, last year, detecting genetic loci uh, that influence the morphology of the human cerebral cortex. As you can see here, as you travel around the cortex, there are different markers in the genome that influence the morphometry 
of these different areas. And you can assemble here, as was done in this paper, an ideogram or a genetic map of the markers that uh, are associated with cortical uh, thickness and surface area. There are some hot spots in the genome here on chromosome 15 with markers that affect uh, cortical morphology. And there's a great deal of interest ongoing now in linking the genetic loci that influence uh, risk for disease with loci that appear to affect uh, brain structure. And, and if there's a commonality, that could give us some clues as to mechanisms that are um, operating in, in causing uh, disease risk. Another quick update, uh, the study of genetic loci that influence uh, subcortical morphometry uh, was, was published in uh, Nature Genetics in 2019. Recent work by Miguel Renteria, Adrian Campos, and Sarah Medland uh, have now found 549 genetic loci affecting subcortical volumes. And you could say, well, how much difference does it make? Do people with different genetic code have very much difference in brain structure? And I think one of the most remarkable things is that now around 5% of the variance in the volumes of these different key brain structures, all of them implicated in neurological and psychiatric disease, the hippocampus, brainstem, putamen, and chordate, uh, is explainable from common genetic variants. Uh, even a polygenic score computed from their GWAS can predict uh, or account for around 5% of the variance. And in uh, non-European ancestry samples, um, in, for example, the ABCD cohort, around 2 to 3% of variance uh, is also explained. Now, are there genetic variants that affect the rate of brain growth and degeneration? Yes, there are. So Rachel Brower and Hilke holshoff -Pohl, um, essentially computed rates of brain change across the lifespan from people who'd been scanned twice with MRI. And then they linked the rates that they observe for different brain structures. You can see different brain structures shown here with genetic variation and discovered, in fact, uh, 15 genetic loci that influence the speed of brain growth and, 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 and aging, some of them operating all the time in a non-age dependent way and others coming in later in life or only operating during development. Ongoing GWAS, if you want to contribute, uh, are going on for DTI cerebellar anatomy, as we mentioned with uh, Sarah Medell and Ian Harding and Rebecca Carestes. Uh, also subcortical GWAS, EEG uh, and fMRI GWAS. If you're interested in taking part, you can contact the people who are noted here. Now, rare variation is also important. So often uh, there are rare uh, but important genetic deletions and duplications. And the Enigma CNV working group has been cataloging these and finding scans of people with um, genetic repeats uh, or deletions and trying to understand what the effects are on the brain. And so here's some really remarkable papers by Ida Sandeby at University of Oslo, uh, and also work by Sébastien Jacquemont and Clara, Clara Moreau in Montreal, finding uh, commonalities among different types of genetic deletion uh, in the systems that are affected, and also commonalities with the disorders uh, for which these genetic deletions put you at risk. And so there are uh, similarities between idiopathic disorders that are found in the general population, such as schizophrenia and ADHD, and the brain differences that are evident in people that carry uh, genetic deletions that put them at risk for these disorders. A um, lot of power to identify signatures. This work is, is ongoing. And uh, here's Ida Sonderby, Dr. Sonderby, showing um, the pattern of effects of different uh, genetic deletions. A little bit uh, to, to end with uh, is future directions. So um, machine learning and deep learning and AI are all very, very interesting. And with multi-site neuroimaging and genetic data, um, you could maybe find very interesting patterns that, that maybe had not been uh, discovered before. Um, one such group, the Enigma Brain Age group, um, is uh, actually has developed an algorithm that you could try. Uh, the website, uh, Tim Hahn's website is shown here where you can try it where you can upload your regional volumetric data from the brain and estimate the age of the person. And uh, that's an interesting exercise anyway, but also they found that in major depression and other psychiatric conditions, uh, the apparent age of the brain uh, appears to be older than the person's chronological age. Um, and it's a very interesting uh, concept to study uh, potential accelerated aging uh, in disease. One cautionary note for applying machine learning to multi-site data uh, has been voiced by Dr. Yanli Zhang James. So she's been doing very interesting work on machine learning in autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. And she's observed that, as a matter of fact, many of the studies with machine learning of ADHD and autism spectrum disorder have been in actually rather small samples. Enigma, fortunately, is an exception. There's around three to 4,000 individuals with scans. But then it's led to really rather optimistic uh, conclusions as to whether 
um, a, a machine learning method can diagnose the disease based on the data, often due to overfitting. So when uh, these methods are trained on a rather limited amount of data, they can tend to overtrain and give you rather optimistic results. And she assembled this really interesting curve that shows that uh, accuracy um, in, in diagnosing, uh, for example, uh, autism spectrum disorder based on brain MRI appears to be very good indeed, uh, at least in, in the data that you use to train the algorithm, but doesn't really do very well in independent data, cross-validation data shown in green. But this uh, behavior tends to recover when you have um, 2,000 to 3,000 examples. Uh, we certainly need more data uh, to train these algorithms, and then it uh, levels out at, at quite reasonable performance. Yan Li has also been looking at uh, different uh, machine learning, deep learning uh, methods um, to uh, do computer-aided uh, diagnostic classification of uh, ASD and ADHD. And she's finding that variational autoencoders, a uh, very novel concept from machine learning and deep learning, are tending to outperform or do very well uh, versus at least traditional methods such as uh, sparse regression uh, and group lasso. And so there's a very interesting line of work. Um, Shi Zhu working with uh, Yuval Neria and Raj Mori in the Enigma PGC PTSD working group have actually merged structural diffusion and resting state data uh, to make predictions about PTSD uh, diagnosis. This is a very nice roadmap for those of you doing multimodal machine learning, really interesting work here. And they're trying to compare whether having all of these modalities versus just one, uh, you, you are better able to make predictions about diagnosis and prognosis. Also, a really nice toolkit, Hugh Garavan uh, and Sage Han have uh, written a number of papers um, on machine learning in the context of addiction, but also dealing with highly imbalanced samples. Often the site has only patients or only controls, and they, they've really shown how to incorporate uh, these samples in, in very highly imbalanced uh, uh, scenarios and, and boost the performance of their machine learning methods. So just in the final minute, uh, if you'd like to join in with these, you're very welcome to. Enigma has a number of projects all going on. This year, I think we've been focusing more on understanding machine learning and deep learning and how to apply it for patient subtyping and predicting outcomes from brain images and other biomarkers. Very active question is whether deep learning methods such as variation autoencoders or generative adversarial networks can help harmonize data or adjust data that's coming from different sources and scanners uh, to better make uh, uh, your group inferences or conclusions uh, in a meta-analysis or a machine learning analysis. Um, with the help of Ilya Veer, Leo Waller, Susanna Oak, and Henrik Walter, uh, resting state fMRI analyses have been piloting uh, in the PTSD and M MDD working groups with re really great success. And then also, as I mentioned, there are uh, harmonized analysis of newer data modalities, MEG and EG, for example. Um, Doug Smith leads the Enigma EG working group if you have EG data that you're interested in, in uh, clubbing together to, to analyze. And then methods and toolboxes to look at new systems, the cerebellum, uh, Rebecca Caresti's and Ian Harding's uh, toolbox, uh, very, very useful, uh, very, very easy to use. Matthew Kempton's VBM method, and also Sarah LaRiviere and Boris Bernhardt's toolbox for relating cross-modal uh, data. And I'd encourage you to check that one out. So if you want to join in, uh, do uh, either ask us or you will find a project uh, that you might enjoy taking part in, or if you want to lead a project, that's also perfectly fine. Uh, and do go to the website to, to join in. Um, and you can see a lot of information there uh, on the different projects and, and how to join. So in conclusion, thank you uh, to all of you for listening. Many of you made these projects possible. You either participated or led them or contributed expertise and data. And uh, we, we really appreciate the broad diversity of uh, talents that have been brought to bear on this and uh, funding from NIH and across the world that has helped fund the data acquisition analysis that I've reported today. So thanks so much for your uh, interest and appreciate your time with us. Thanks very much.